Hi everyone. So the boost day is over, but yeah, to have also the presentation on video, we decided to make some some small recap. So it was really great to have a lot of people in the boost day. I'm Björn Meyer working at Chopper as engineering lead for frontends, composable frontends, and the storefront team. And yeah, it's really really great to do this again. <laughs> so, so the idea of this presentation is um, to give you a starting point to for composable frontends. And in my presentation, I will always call it frontends because it's a bit shorter. So the presentation has a lot of links and yeah, so you can, can use it as a reference. And if you have deeper questions, so I guess you will you will find them. Um, so we have a lot of topics today. So I will I will try to 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 stretch it a bit to reduce the time because at boost day it was over one hour. And yeah, to have it on a shorter video, I will try to <laughs> to improve it. Uh, so let's talk about the topics. What to expect from composable front ends? What not to expect? We will talk about that shortly. And I will also talk about the templates we have, how to set it up, and what kind of packages are used in the templates, what kind of composables we provide to you um, as ready to use. And I will also tell you about um, the demo store. Um, what was for me, I, I just choose some topics, what was interesting for me um, at the beginning, what I learned. And then how to organize your projects, especially as an agency. And then we will a bit talking about if there is really an ecosystem missing. And yeah, the roadmap, what have we done? How will the future look like? And a lot of links, like I said. And on the right, you have this nice little cap for you. So that's that's it. And yeah, it looks very easy, I guess. Let's Let's start. Yeah, what to expect from composable frontends? I would say a custom template. So in in generally, when you want to build a really custom frontend, then you should think about composable frontends. Also, we have a, a really boring uh, tech stack. I'm I'm saying, and boring I mean in a very good way because it's very solid. So we have Nuxt, View three, TypeScript. So um, yeah, if you're familiar with uh, JavaScript world and TypeScript, then um, you can have can make very fast progress, I would say. And also because it's so boring and uh, solid, we have uh, out of the box very great developer experience. Also with Nitro, so the developer server is very fast. You can. Um, you directly see what you are changing and if you have some error and stuff like that. So it's really great developer experience. You can make a lot of progress. If you think about other systems where it sometimes takes a lot of time to rebuild the front end, this is this is not what you should expect here. So it's it's really, really nice. And for the styling, we rely on Uno CSS and we use a preset that is a tailwind. So we decided to have Uno CSS as an additional layer, and then you can change to other presets like you want, maybe Bootstrap or something else. But I have also slides about that later. So, and we rely totally on the store API or on the admin API. I will also talk a bit about this later because we have a new API client in the house. So basically we rely on RPs and, um, and that's a good thing because um, you only have yeah one single source of truth. So that's, that's really cool. Um, yeah, we have also white there and white tests. So if you, if you like unit testing or if you like, we also have playwright in, in our repository. So if you like end-to-end -end test, Playwright would be also a nice fit or V-test for, for the unit testing. 
But maybe more important is what not to expect. So if you know Shopware 6, do not expect themes like they are in Shopware 6. Um, yeah, because it's it's totally not like that. So you do not change any any configuration in the administration and the theme gets updated or something like that. And also inheritance, um, I will I will show you later that there is possibility to reuse things and to override things, but you should not um, expect inheritance like it was in, in Shopware uh, 6 in, in the storefront themes. And do not expect an out-of-the-box solution like we are really on a custom template so that also means for sure you need to build something with your team or in project specific things. So there is not an out of the box solution. So we have, we already have a lot of things like um, checkout, account, category, search, whatever. So we have a demo store where we have a lot of examples how, how you can solve uh, the, the goal to create a really good e-commerce shop um, but for sure there will be some requirements or features that um, your customer wants to have and you have to build it by their own because of that it's a custom theme so it's not complete a complete feature set and there's also not really a marketplace for the front ends and yeah, what is really cool is you don't need to expect uh, update stress so or plugin compatibility problems. So because we rely only on the, the RP API, um, you, you ha have not the stress like if somebody is overwriting the same blocks or if some plugins you changing the same same class. So stuff like that you will not have like you you know it maybe from from the storefront from the Twig theme. So there could be there could be problems or at least when you install the first plugin, mostly it's working. But with more plugins you have, the more stress you get. So because it's split up with the front end and the, and the admin and it's totally headless, you don't have that much stress. So normally the RP API is not breaking, but also the downside is maybe you need to create some APIs by yourself. So that means you don't have API support everywhere. Yeah, that, that are the, the things you should not expect. So I um, was really fast and maybe I forgot some stuff, but I guess that's, that's the main things you should not expect from composable frontends. So maybe um, I also decided to write down some good indicators for choosing composable frontends. And these are just some examples I, I tell a lot, like it's, it's totally fine if it's not for everyone. Um, so you can, if your team is, for example, very good with PHP and Twig and you don't have this update stress and the plugin, you know your plugins, you have only own plugins or stuff like that. So when this is working fine for you, then just use the storefront, the default Twig storefront. That's totally fine. The good thing um, when you want to choose composable frontends is you don't have to wait that the storefront gets updates. So if you want to have some specific feature in, in the storefront, and the core team is working on that, that's totally fine, but you have to wait until it's released. And if your developer team want to go faster or want to own the front end, then it's a good indicator maybe to use composable front ends. And also if your developer team has JavaScript, TypeScript, Nuxt, Vue, React experience, it's also a very good indicator to use front ends. And in general, yeah, if your customer want a completely custom corporate design and not just changing some logos, some some colors. So um, if you really going custom, so not not oriented on the on the default um, storefront, then it's also a good indicator to to do this with composable frontends because it's 
it's for sure more work to change the default storefront um, to the custom design instead of uh, building it from the ground up with front ends. So that's also a good indicator. Also, if you want to start just with a sub store or a subset of products, it's really nice indicator because then the risk is also very low and you can use the small pro uh, project also for your developers to motivate them so if you if your developers always doing um, default storefront and they maybe want to try out some new technology like motivating them learning some new stuff and you have a, a small set of features for for some project then I would say it's also a nice, nice indicator to use composable frontends. And if you have a payment provider that already supports the headpads, headless approach, then it's it's also nice to yeah to have it. So we have we are working uh, currently a lot on on payment integrations to have more examples and stuff for you. So there are some already that are really good working but we need more and if you have plugins apps they when they rely so you want to use some specific plugin plugin or app and they rely on the store rp that's also good so you always check your plugins or your features and if you you find a plugin that provides this feature then check if the plugin has everything done with the store api so rp first api first and then you are ready to go. So this is just some some indicators for you. And <clears throat> yes, now let's have a look on the templates. We have five templates. Um, so what when you look at our demo store, I have also um, a link to the to the demo store for you. So the view demo store template that is that is the demo store, and uh, most of the projects out there they cloned this demo store at some specific point and then they changed um, components they changed templates to their needs but um, it's better to to start with some blank um, template so if you want to start with the view blank then you have view nux and typescript so it's just just a plain we, we set up all the plain stuff for you and you have a, a empty template where you can start creating your stuff and you already have the, the config for Nux and stuff like that. Um, so it's better for the developer team to start on a blank template because then when it's building and it's growing, the team knows how are the components connected, how are the pages structured and, and all that stuff. So the, they know how the data is flowing. And if you use the view demo store, then you have to check out how the data is. Um, so you, when you build it yourself from the ground up, the understanding or on the long term, it's better for the understanding of the project and you know where you can change things um, better instead of just using the blueprint. So we see the demo store as a blueprint, like we, testing our own stuff there and also maybe try out some ideas we have. Um, but it's not like we suggesting to use it for a project. You can use it and a lot of um, people do that. That's totally fine. But it's, yeah, you, you have to also, you have to understand it. And it's better to start from a blank, then you understand everything instead of you starting from the demo store and then you have to look and to test so sometimes it's maybe uh, consuming more time to to get into a structure you have not built up yourself so that's that's just a suggestion um or a recommendation i would say and we have uh, also this shop reversal commerce template that's really new so it's based on react next.js tailwind and it does not have any checkout at the moment, but we're working on a solution for that. So currently you have the headless front end with React Next.js and pages, and you can add products to the card and stuff like that. But when you want to check out, there is no 
um, connection because the checkout is the default checkout with the Twig storefront, but um, we need some yeah some solution to to pass from a headless uh, front end to a default storefront checkout. So there there will be some some feature in the future and the checkout will be will be there and it's also it's not so complicated to build it by yourself. So basically you're just getting some you give some parameter with an URL and the checkout has to reload the the card for the customer and then he goes out of um, out of the checkout with all the default plugins. But it's not there at the moment, I just want to mention. So but it's if you are interested in React and Next.js, um, this template has all the new features. Like it's using the app folder, so it's it's really cool um, to to look how how this is working and how they they use the te new technology. So that's really really cool if you want to. And also in this shop reversal commerce template. We're using the new RP client. So if you're interested in the new RP client, um, I will also talk with packages uh, in shortly. Then you can look into the code here. There's a library, a lib folder, where we're using completely only the new RP client. Yeah, how to set up. <clears throat> so normally you're just cloning the, the view demo store. You go into the new folder and you install with NPM and then you run it. Then, then you are fine. So we have we have a default configuration for you that is using our Shopware Cloud instance, and that's yeah. We just decided to do it that way, so you don't have to have to do any config, and you see immediately if the if everything is working. So you execute the command; it's running. You're getting our demo data from the Cloud instance, and you are fine. And you can also test it on, on StackBlitz. And when you go or when you're working in the project, you want to set it up locally. So you have an admin or a shopper instance locally running on your computer. Then you can change um, the config. So on the left image, you see we have the shopper endpoint. So that's the URL to, to the admin and the access token. So you just need to change this to config durations and then you have to restart your your development your next uh, server has to restart and then he gets the new data from your local environment and normally we're using devenv or ddev for that and yeah so i will not talk about you can also use docker so you have one docker container with a um, node running and one with a uh, shopware but then you have to take care about the connection between that containers. So you have to, to open the ports and it's a bit more work. So we're using DevEnv starting it and just uh, starting in, a, in um, the front end and then connect them and it's, it's really easy. So everything is local. You don't have any, any cause or connection problems uh, with that. So it's, it's the way how we, how we work. And yeah, so after that, so you started everything, you have a have a shop. This is on the on the left side, you see um, the smartphone, the mobile view with some content that is coming from the shopping experience, uh, the CMS. And on the right side, you have a category view, just a default on the on the top, the, the main navigation on the left side, uh, the sub navigation of the current uh, categories, yeah, stuff like that. And you have here the link uh, to, to check it out online. So if you want to, to look around or test it, um, go on that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I already talked a bit about packages. So if you, so composable front ends, the idea behind that is to have, I would say, a platform agnostic tools you can use everywhere to really build fast a custom um, template, custom online shop for you. So at the beginning, we started with an default RP, uh, a handcrafted RP client, 
and and this API client used also a package that was uh, that is called types. So if when you do an API call, you also say, okay, I'm getting back this type of object and TypeScript is then doing the auto completion for you in, in your IDE. So that was really cool. Um, but then at some point we realized, okay, handcrafted, yeah, that's, that's cool, but it's also um, yeah, if you're getting new st uh, endpoints, and if you're having uh, custom endpoints and stuff like that, it's not really, yeah, it's manual work a lot. So we decided also to create a new RP client. So that's the RP client next package. And this RP client is um, generated. So it's based on the open RP schema. So what it does, um, you have a you have a shopware instance, and it collects the the open API schema files, and then out of that it generates the endpoints and the types and objects and all that stuff. So that means the yeah the future is that we integrate this API client next into our demo store and also updating all the composables because currently the composables package is using the old RP client, but in the future, this will be changed that the composables using the new RP client. So that had, has, um, yeah, it's, it's better because you cannot forget anything. So in a handcrafted RP client, it can happen that we have maybe forgotten some parameters or you have objects coming back that are changed and stuff like that. So you have always um, manual work and with the generated one, it's it's more bulletproof, but it also, um, we, we also need to, to rework in, in the core teams because we have to validate the open API schema against the real implementation means uh, if the endpoint is changing, somebody needs also to update the open API schema. So it's matching again, and we need a validation for that in our pipeline. So, so that's really important because um, if the open API schema is not good, we cannot generate also good objects and good endpoints and stuff like that. But it's really, really nice um, out there. And the goal is also the new API client can be used for the store API and for the admin API. Um, so that's that's really cool. So, have, so you have one client for, for everything and the new API client supports different version of Shopware. Like you saying, okay, I have this version of Shopware, give me, um, give me the, the type definition for that and the endpoints for that, and then you are ready ready to go. So um, you can have, yeah, in projects, different um, shopware versions and the API client knows already which endpoints you can use, what parameters we have and stuff like that. So we provide you with the type definitions, um, but you can also, if you have a custom project, you can also generate it by yourself. Like you have, for example, some custom apps and plugins that have added some endpoints, then you can generate the, the types and the endpoints definition for yourself. So there's some documentation in the readme of the new API client where there's a generate command. As a, so you can generate really the endpoints the customer has, and then you can use it in the composable front end. So that's, that's really cool. And remember, if you want to see, so it's also possible to extend the API client, the new API client. So you can also change objects and endpoints and stuff like that. Or you can also um, yeah, tell the API client about other endpoints. So that's possible. And look at the examples in the React uh, Versal Commerce template. So there we, we use it already. So that was our proof of concept for the new RP client and it's really working working good but also yeah test it out if something is unclear we will also provide some some blog post about that um, how to set it up how to use it um, 
and it's really helpful. So when you use an endpoint and you forgot some required parameter, it it will tell you. So you will already see in the code during writing that something is wrong. Yeah. So another important package is um, helpers. We have, or well, it's let's say it's the stateless functions. Um, you can find there so everything with formatting, um, transforming objects and stuff like that is is in in the helpers package. Then we have our our composables packages, where there's totally only composition RP used, and it is the so help helpers is the stateless and composables is the state a full package. So the composables are talking with with the RP and stuff like that. So I have also an example for that. And if you have, um, if you want to set up a Nuxt uh, project, you can just use the Nuxt three module package. So in that package, we already have the RP client and the composables. So you just install that, and then you already have the configuration uh, for that. So it also provides you with a configuration. And then we have the CMS base package. This we use, so it provides you a lot of components and templates. Um, you can then override. So normally you, you have a call to, to some CMS page and there's a lot of structure in a JSON and we pass that structure building templates out of that. And in your project, you can override the templates to your needs. So that's, that's just the base that you don't have all the struggle with the setup with the structure so we're taking away that from you and you just working in the com components with your templates and change the blocks and stuff like that yeah let's go on uh, a long part about packages but packages really it's the important part so that are the things where we um, look for breaking changes and provide updates and improve all the stuff. And the goal is here to use the packages in different projects. So, but in the demo store, so we go into the demo store, um, this folder structure is really basic. So if you are familiar with Nuxt, then you will, you will know these folders and you know exactly what to do in which folder. And if not, there's a Nux directory documentation. It's really, really helpful. So I would, um, if you're asking yourself, okay, what, how is the, how can I create pages? Then you go just to the Nux directory documentation, clicking on pages, and then he will explain a lot about pages, how you can structure them, how you can use them, and stuff like that. And what we have, or what is a bit uh, different, is we have this UNU config uh, TypeScript file because we're using UNU. We we have that as as yeah as configuration for you. So maybe let's look into that. Um, yeah, just just an example. So on the left side, you see the UNU UNU config uh, TypeScript file where we importing all the presets we want to use. So you have also the, the theme config, you know, from Tailwind, maybe where you can define your colors, your font size and stuff like that. And then you can say, okay, I want to use presets. I want the icon presets and I want to use the carbon icons, for example. So, but you can also change that. So you can change to, to something else like Windy CSS or Bootstrap or whatever. So, that's that's really cool. Um, so you are not you don't need to use Tailwind if you don't want to, or you don't also need to use Uno if you don't want to use Uno. You just remove the config file. You remove the module. So on the right side you see the next config, and there is this modules array, and there you see there's a Uno CSS next module. So when you remove it, then um, yeah, Uno will be not loaded and stuff like that and yeah on the right side in the max config you also see that we're using some reset from uno css reset we're using the tailwind combat and that's yeah that's just to reset the default styles from the browsers and 
yeah, most of the config goes in the UNU config TypeScript file. At the beginning of, of the demo store, we had the UNU config also in the Nux config, but the documentation, so the link for the documentation is also at the top um, for UNU is uh, suggesting uh, to use a UNU config TypeScript file. So we moved to the UNU config TypeScript file that you that you find yourself um, in the in the right place because it was maybe confusing for users that we had everything in in the next config. So yeah, so that's that's about Uno CSS. Um, yeah, let's talk about what is a composable. I guess that's that's the most important part. And like I already said, so it's it's about stateful versus stateless, and stateful is also an RP endpoint. So because the, the state we getting from our RP and the RP is getting the state obviously from the database. Um, so in the context of a view application, a composable is a function that leverage views composition RP to encapsulate and reuse stateful logic. And there's, so it's it's about stateful and it's about composition RP. So if you're not familiar with the composition RP that was introduced with view three, I would suggest to read this FAQ because it's really helpful. And if you're familiar with that, you will find, uh, yeah, the structure of the composition RP is always the same. So you will, you will find everything you need very fast. So, but at the beginning, when I was looking at the demo store, uh, I guess it's now seven months ago. For me, it was a lot of things. So we providing a lot of composables, but the good thing is the composables take away from you to know the store RP. So when you when you know the store RP and you know the composables, you can see, okay, use card um, will be using store RP card, something like that. At the end, so at the end, I was for me it was important to know okay, where how is the the way the data flows like, so a composable always starts with use, that that's a rule. So if you see something like use card, you know okay it's a composable because it starts with use, and and a composable I would say is. Yeah, it's a class that provides um, functions you can easily use. So it's, yeah, for example, use category or use navi navigation. I guess we also have, yeah, use navigation search or use navigation context. Um, this can be used in different places. So the idea is, yeah, to, to compose it. So, but it, at the beginning, it was for me important to understand how is the data flowing. And then I was, okay, here I have this example for you. How is, is the, the use card uh, getting his data? So at first you're looking into the template of the demo store in the app view file. So that's the, the main entry point. And then you see just this use card and something like refresh card. And at the beginning I was wondering, okay, where's the, Where's the import for this use card? And I was, oh, ah, there is some concept like auto imports. So it's important to know that Nuxt is doing auto imports. And so you can use use card uh, at some more places just without the import. So you don't need to write import use card from blah, 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 whatever. So he already has it. And you just import it. So if you don't familiar with that, just look at the documentation. So okay, on the on the left side we have this use card, refresh card, and so it's in the templates. And then we have on on the second image we have composables packages, composables, and there is some use card TypeScript file. And in that use card TypeScript file, there's a function. And this function called refresh card, and it's an async function. And so what we're doing in the first image is we just get this function because we want to use it. So we, we put it in some, some const 
call it refresh card and yeah so we we get it out of the use card and then we can later call it in the template to refresh the card so, but in the async function refresh card there's there's a, a wait so you know when there's a, a wait with get card you know there's there's a third uh, a second async function so ignore the other stuff and you see like i was talking um all the types here this this promise card these types are coming from from the types package and yeah and this this will be will be changed at least uh, from where we get it and when you look at the third image then we are in the package rp client source services card service so there's a card service and there's a export async function with get card and yeah in that function we're using the the rp instance and there's an invoke and we invoke um yeah to to get uh, so it's a get request so we invoke the the request and pa passing down the get checkout card endpoint so the instance knows which endpoint to call if there would be more parameters in this case we don't we just get it, the card because normally you have the the context token but all that context token you don't need to provide that's already handled in the shopper API instance. So in, in the get call, you're just saying, okay, I want to, to call this checkout card endpoint and getting the current card. And uh, the access token and the context token, that's already um, applied to the request. So you don't need to, to put it here in this get request. And that's it. So that's it. Uh, it's really... Yeah, that's that's the way. Like from use card to get card, from from get card to to the to the endpoint, the real endpoint. And for me, it was really um, yeah good to understand. So there's no magic. So I just need to look around and maybe search also in the packages to find the way how the data is flowing. And when you understand that, it's really, yeah, it's also very good because then you can, if something, some endpoint is not providing the data you expecting, then you can look how the endpoint is called with which parameter. And you can do the same in some other um, API, API client like Postman or Insomnia or something like that. And with the new RP client, there will also be a function that will um, output the, the body for you. Like at the moment, it's a bit difficult to get the body, the JSON you're sending to this endpoint. And with the new RP client, this will be also easier because then you can just uh, call a function to get the body, copy the body and do the same request to see if the store RP is working. Yeah, that's that was really helpful for me. And another topic was this use async data. And like you see, we have uh, again the use at the beginning, so it's a composable. And the use async data composable is provided by Nuxt. And I would say it's one of the most used um, composables. So, um, yeah. The, the power of use async data is that when you have a request to the server and the server is do, is calling your your endpoint like we getting reloading the navigation elements on the server and from the server he provides the data also to the client so there is normally in in the old days the server was fetching the data then the client was loading the JavaScript, the, the page was retraded, and maybe maybe the client was fetching the data again. So you had maybe two calls, so one on the server side and one on the client side. And with use async data, there's a way where you can call an endpoint on the server, and the data is already 
provided, uh, so the payload is provided to the client and you can just use it. You don't need to refetch again. So that's the, that's the power. And the use async data composable has a lot of options. So you can, for example, here in the, in the image, we're providing a key, a unique key. This is optional. If you don't provide any key, there will be a generated key. But sometimes when you want to use the data again in some other places, it's really nice to have a key because then you just say, okay, payload main navigation, I want to use the data I already have and don't need to fetch it again. So, but look at the other options we have. So, yeah, we have mostly four options like lazy, client-only fetching, minimized payload size, caching, and refetching. And yeah, so let's just talk about lazy. So um, yeah, lazy, normally um, the server is waiting for the request to end. Like when you have a request and um, you're calling some slow RP, or maybe it's not that important for, for the dome to be rendered. So the server is waiting for the request to end, and that could be a problem in some situations. So if you know it's a heavy request you are doing and the data is maybe um, yeah, not so important, then when you say lazy, he, he uh, no, I'm wrong, damn. That's okay. That's the difference because lazy and client only fetching is the difference. So if I'm saying client only fetching, the server is not waiting. So server falls. So I'm saying, okay, I, do, I don't want the server to fetch the data. I'm saying option server falls. And then I don't have, have it in my dome for SEO. So, but that's for some data that could be fine. So if not SEO relevant data. And then, so if I'm, if I'm saying also lazy, then it means also that only client-side navigation. So if you, for example, um, the first hard request is hitting the server, then he downloads all the JavaScript, and then you click on some links, then the server is not, not in the place because it's only happening on the on the client side. So only the initial request is handled by the server. You're getting, you're getting your DOM and then you're downloading the, the JavaScript and then every other request is handled in the client side. And with lazy, you, you say, okay, this request should be only handled on client side navigation. But when you do that, you also have to think about the loading state. So there are differences. So you can combine lazy and client only fetching. Then this data will only be handled on the client side. So if you say lazy true and server false, it's only handled on the client side. Um, what is also important, minimize payload size. Um, so if you have a lot of JSON coming back from the RP and you just need one, two, or three um, properties from the JSON, um, then, you, then you can pick it. Then you can say in the options, I want to pick the name and the price. And that's really good for your application in the front end because all the data that is passed around is smaller and you have to think about a lot of JSON is also passed by the browser. So, the smaller your JSON is, the better it is for, for the navigation and for the user. And you have a lot of options like <clears throat> you can uh, combine use as in data with watch. So for example, um, when you have an, an select on the page, let's say we have a select for, yeah, for some uh, stores we have. And if you change the store, you can refetch data from an RP endpoint to update the information, the address for the store. So that's also cool. So you can have an initial store and then the customer change the select, you refetch again. So you can combine use async data with watch and then um, it's cool, cool to use. 
Um, yeah, and and all the use as in data is is developer sugar. Like I call, I said at the beginning, we have a good developer experience, and that's a good example because the Nuxt guys or the Vue guys, they really think about how to use the function and maybe they also provide functions that are just alias for something else. Like in this example, it's it's for fetch, um, but it makes makes it so much easier to, to come to the solution and to use it in a good way. So that's that's really cool. And yeah, if you then open your dev tools, uh, so we here we are have started a local front end um, and in a local development environment you will have the Nux Dev Tools on the left side. There's a small icon. You can open that and there are a lot of tabs. And I would suggest to you to, to watch into every tab at least once to see what kind of data Nux can provide to you. And you will also find um, all the data that was loaded. So if you're searching for some data you want to use in your template or stuff like that, you can open the developer tools and see uh, what data you already have before you're fetching again some data because every request counts. So less request, the better it is. And also if you're using Nuxt modules or components, then you will also see how they are connected if some component is loading slow and stuff like that. So I really suggest to you watch into that and look around. It will give you a better understanding of the application and where you can, can find stuff. So yeah, <clears throat> we already talked a bit about rendering modes. Um, normally, for our demo store, we started with universal rendering and this is the default rendering. And if you, like I said before, if you have a request, a hard reload, then it hits the server. The server generates the HTML and yeah, the client then downloads the JavaScript and hydration uh, is taking in place. When you decide to have only client-side rendering, the server is much faster because he does not need to, to call some RPs to create the, the HTML. So he will just provide an empty HTML and then we will download the JavaScript files and then the interaction kicks in. And client-side rendering was, in the past, it was default and it was... Yeah, it was a lot of problems because of SEO and a lot of bots could not read the, the HTML and stuff like that. But for some um, cases, I guess client-side rendering would also make sense. So if you have, for example, um, a warehouse and um, you want to build some small application to, to collect the the packages and stuff like that, then you could, for example, you decide we use client-side rendering because it's it's a bit faster. Everything is happening on the iPhones the, the employees have and stuff like that. And currently the demo store is using some um, hybrid rendering. So in the next slide, I have some, some example how we configured it. So you can configure for route rules, different caching, um, mechanism and yeah that's that's how we do it at the moment because it's it's much faster than this universal rendering at least for for the first uh, request and stuff like that so we I have also some pull requests and on some slide where we have some um, performance measurements we did um, when we changed that and there's also some some command in Nuxt, Nuxt generate command. So what you can do is also combining um, these things, like you can pre-render pre the, the HTML, so not the server is um, generating on the fly. When the request is hitting the server, he is normally generating the HTML. You can pre-render it with a command before. So when you build also this, this command will be run and put the HTML already to, to uh, the file system. 
And later when the, the server gets hit for this route, he can just uh, return the HTML and it's, it's also much faster. But the downside of the pre-rendering is that you, yeah, that maybe the data is out of date. So if you're thinking about static site generations, um, yeah, uh, I know some projects, they generated everything static and then they had some some islands, I would say, like for example, uh, the stock was an the stock availability was an island. So the page completely was generated and they generated every night a completely new. And and there are also uh, ways to just generate what has changed, like you update a product in, in the administration, and then this product gets generated. So if you're interested in that, just, just pick me. And so they, they they did that and it was much faster because the server don't need to do anything. He just provide the HTML for that page. And then they use the time with the islands um, architecture. That means only the, the request to the stock is done on the client side and yeah, there's a loading indicator. And after some seconds after the request was done, uh, the client see if the product is uh, still in stock or something like that. Yeah, so there are a lot of ways to combine uh, rendering modes, caching and pre-generation. And you can really, yeah, have a lot of strategies about that so that's that's really cool because they give you all all possibilities um in in your hand and that's really cool about next and yeah just just some words about edge side rendering so that means it's basically hybrid rendering on some platform that supports um to be on the edge so with edge functions and stuff like that and that's that could be something like a reversal netlify and stuff like that but edge side rendering is is really cool because it's happening where the client is um but it also needs a bit more effort because you have hard limits hard dependencies stuff like that so there is not you you have to think about what to use and what not because not everything you can do with JavaScript is supported. So you on some things you have to depend on browser APIs. APIs, <laughs> sorry for that, APIs. Um, yeah, let's look at the root, row, root rules config. So on the left side of the, on the left image, you see our um, current configuration. So we caching for one day, um, the home page and every other page. And for example, we don't use server-side rendering for the search, for the checkout, um, and there is more, but I, I just shorten it here. And on the right side, you see the Nitro. So Nitro is the server engine that um, runs on Nuxt, um, or under Nuxt, I would say. Um, and you can do a lot of more things. You can redirect, you can do proxies, you can set header um, header options and stuff like that. So there's this Nitro route rules documentation. It's not easy to find because of that. I put the link here and yeah, so that's, that's really cool. And yeah, that's all about rendering modes. So let's maybe shortly talk about next layers or uh, yeah, Nuxt extends, it's also called. So um, yeah, so the idea is if you are an agency and you're building your own composables or components and you want to reuse them in a project, then I would suggest to you watch this intro video. It's just three minutes. So after that, you get the concept. So the idea is with Next extends, or it's called next layers. Um, yeah, you can reuse components from a Git repository or from, yeah. So it's really easy. So you can just say next extend this uh, composables or this uh, components 
and then you can also override it in the project so it's i would say it's good when you're starting with a, a nux project the first time i would not use layers but it's good to think about what we can move later out of the project after learning a lot of things into another repository let's call it our components repository and for the second project you reuse the components so it's you should not always build the same components over and over for every project uh, manually so you can just I would say start in one project and after the project is finished move the components you want to reuse to another repository put it in the structure you need so there's a documentation how, how the structure should be but it's basically it's the same structure like a next project and then you can can share it between other projects so that's that's my uh, recommendation for you look at next layers look at the video look and make some strategy how to reuse composables and components so if you want to go with uh, composable front ends and you want to make more than one project with that um, then you have to organize that with the yeah, easiest way is with layers it's easier than creating modules um, yeah and because a lot of people always saying there is an ecosystem missing i mean yeah there's no marketplace we don't have that like we don't have a marketplace like shopware marketplace um, but we have uh, next modules and next modules provides a lot um, so there are i guess over 100 uh, modules and we have for example story block i also tried to integrate that and it took me two hours to have a basic connection between my composable front ends and story block and there's also a Stripe a module. There's something for cookies and, and stuff like that. So I just put some, some examples here. And I put also the documentation how to write own modules um, in, on the right. But yeah, so basically I'm saying um, every app or plugin that exposed the store API can be used. So if you check the app and the plugin you want to use and it use use the store api a lot then you only need to build the ui components in in the front end so that means if the plugin is exposing store api a lot you're just missing the ui the user interface and that's you have to build by yourself and also for example other apps or plugins like uh, text providers they are doing uh, text calculation and mostly they do that in the back end and this data is then exposed via the store api uh, so the customer knows how many texts he has to pay but the the calculation is happening in the back end uh, or in the admin then it's also no no problem to use that app or plugin also for example for newsletter most of the newsletter plugin, they're using the default newsletter store RP. So the, the newsletter is basically um, available in, in the shopper admin and later they sync it to, to their API. So if you have something, some feature or use case you want to use there and it's, it's like that, you have no problem. And also, do not underestimate the JavaScript and TypeScript NPM ecosystem. There's very, very much you can use. And basically, Next and Vue, we are in JavaScript ecosystem. So you can use everything that is provided by, by someone. So like, for example, Contentful provides a completely SDK to integrate the RP. So that's really really a good example or molly or pay one they are ready for this headless so they have own sdks written in javascript or typescript or they also have npm packages you can integrate so yeah you have to check it but you also should check every plugin or app you're installing for some customer and if some customer is asking for some payment you have to check okay is they have they some headless approach and you also have to check 
if if there is a plugin for for some payment then then um yeah you you have also to check the uh, the plugin in detail because just installing and hoping it's working i guess it's it's not a good idea so and at the end you still can provide your own um rpm point and then you that's the the most effort i would say but you can can do this like providing the endpoint you need the data you need the, the logic you need and then build your own custom component composable and we also have a place to share next modules so on our documentation page there is some already some community modules so i would not say yes we have no marketplace but i would not say we have no ecosystem we have a really really big ecosystem and there's a lot possible already so just shortly, um, we working completely in the open. We have a project board. You can you can look on the project board what is currently in um, in development. We have discussions if you want to discuss something. So there's also a discussion about when will be a stable release. And um, I want to say, like I said at the beginning, it's a boring stack. It's totally stable. We are working to improve our packages, but you can already use it. And so also when the API client is changing under the hood, we will take care that the demo store is, is working the same afterwards. So there will not be some break for you. Or you also have, like when you own the front end, you have the responsibility so you can stay on old versions. And when you update, for sure, you have the responsibility to test everything for your customer. That's that's totally true. So you have the freedom to build whatever you want, but you also have the responsibility to, to test it in a good way. Um, yeah, so we worked uh, on a lot of topics. Um, I just put some, some links to some important pull requests here. Like we talked about a hybrid rendering. The language switcher sitemap um, we also improved um, to have less calls so look around because i guess this pull requests are really good for learning and understanding so because of that i i put it here um yeah the next topics we want to work on is like we want to integrate the composables package as the new rp client into composables like i talked a lot about we have want to have more integrations or examples in general like how to show you that it's really composable really powerful and easy to to integrate new stuff and a lot of documentations i have some experiments like i want to try bun i want to try uh, nitro streaming if you don't know that there are links for that and yeah but that's that's not all so i mean that's a lot <laughs> Uh, and we also want uh, to support more more core features and stuff like that. And we need a plan how how to do that in detail. Um, but you also have the possibility to um, yeah to tell us what what we should work on. So we have we have a survey with four questions. If you um, yeah if you need some some special feature, just tell us. If you yeah. Tell us what we can do to make composable frontends for you easier to work with. And we also have the Shopware community Slack. So in Shopware community Slack, you can join the Shopware frontends channel. And if you have, yeah, shortly some small questions, we can, we will help you there also. So take the survey, would be nice to have some, some feedback from you if you see some problems or um, want to request some feature and yeah thanks a lot to the team that um, provided me with a lot of input so um, yeah also thanks to Dominic that invented uh, composable front ends I would say and yeah great guys thank you for the onboarding um, and thank you audience for for watching this video so please maybe support us with a with a star on github if you did not already and yeah that's it if you have any questions we are here to help you